present is uh, from visioning to paving the future of digital preservation. Uh, we have been working in this area almost for last uh, 15 years. It's only now that we are finding some ground and where our efforts are being recognized. So before I get into discussing uh, what we are doing in the digital preservation, and there have been certain uh, achievements very recently, I will be reporting that to you. Uh, before I go into that, I would like to first relate this area with the rest of the activities in CDAC. So we need to look at the uh, activities uh, in the human brain because last two days we have seen that many technologies are basically emulating or uh, trying to create similar kind of behavior as in human beings or the way our brain works. Um, I have studied a lot of uh, cognitive science. The Gustav Jung, one of the uh, well-known psychologists, uh, what he says is that human brain is doing two things primarily. One is sensing, and the second is thinking. So sensing is an activity which largely uh, managed through various sense organs, which are pumping or pulling data uh, of various kinds, whether it is the visual data or auditory data, or maybe you have it in the olfactory or the test or the smell. So various kinds of data is basically uh, pulled by the sense organs, and that is the sensing activity. So just now you're all you know, looking at me, looking at the slides. Uh, that is all sensing. The thinking part involves analyzing the data, you know, di dissecting it, juxtaposing it, you know, maybe uh, comparing with what you already knew and what is going on, uh, combining it, relating it, you know, interpreting it. And that basically, in a simple terms, I can say, this is a highly simplified diagram. Um, so it leads to some kind of cognition. Uh, the understanding of uh, uh, what is happening or you form some kind of opinion about it. Uh, Having understood it, what happens is uh, uh, if you were to take certain actions, uh, the small, small decisions, small, small observations that you make, you manage them by short-term memory, which all of you very well know. I, I don't have to really tell you, but that is the temporary store. Whereas if you find something very important, something very emotionally connecting or something which is of great value to you, you you somehow shift it to the long-term memory, wherein you know uh, it basically turns into an experience. Only after you know a lot of uh, you know metamemorial things are attached with that uh, data. You know, in terms of the you relate it with uh, similar things. You also have features and characteristics. You reference it with past events. The semantic linkages, mental associations, ment uh, the multimodal recall is also. Uh, 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 somewhat uh, related with all this. So that is the preservation repository which, uh, which is residing within uh, your brain. You know? So each, each of us, all of us are a repository um, in, a, uh, uh, in his or her own right. And today, I think on the second day, what we found is that the repository is a word, has been the key word since the morning. Uh, even in the, the medical informatics presentation also, they talked of repository. The, um, uh, Dr. Joshi's presentation also made a reference to the repository. And we will be talking about trusted digital repositories in my presentation. So when it comes to uh, managing the memories of a civilization, or the memories of uh, the people, uh, then these memories are reflected in the form of artifacts. These memories are reflected in the form of, uh, as I mentioned, non-tangible heritage is primarily the, uh, the information that is created on computers, you know, which is purely in the bit stream uh, non-tangible form. It doesn't have a physical form. So, uh, and you will be surprised, uh, all our memory, the, which we talk of, you know, keeping it on large data centers or uh, large, uh, you know, storage uh, systems, it's, it's all uh, powered by the electricity. If the electricity goes off, we are out of memory. We have, we have just forgotten everything that we knew. So, or we just don't have access to it. So, uh, so when it comes to uh, transferring the 
uh, information to the long-term memory, what we realize in the digital preservation, you always talk of retention rules. I think since CDAC wide, we are doing this ISO implementation. So uh, Mr. Sunil Misar has been uh, writing to many of us about the retention rules, you know, how long a particular re record should be retained, 10 years, 50 years, whether it is a permanent record or whether it is a temporary record. For example, a bus ticket, you will just throw it away. But a ration card or a, pa or a passport is a permanent record you would like to keep it for a lifetime so what you are doing inside your brain you are exactly doing the same kind of thing in our external life uh, with the belongings with the things that we want to uh, remember things we which which want to cherish have to be maintained in the repositories have to be preserved have to be ensured that you know they remain accessible to us so exactly same thing happening the other uh, metaphorical example that I will give is uh, you must have heard of two diseases. One is amnesia. We, people often, in the digital preservation domain, people often refer uh, digital amnesia. So what happens if, if the file formats became obsolete? What happened uh, if, if the storage devices you know, became obsolete? Or maybe they got corrupted, or maybe you, they got damaged, and, and you lost a whole lot of data. So that is a kind of digital amnesia. So you have just lost uh, a huge store of your memory, which was valuable to you, which, which could have been used. So uh, that, uh, that is digital amnesia. You also have um, uh, digital agnosia. So agnosia is something wherein the sensing activity takes place. You, I mean, you have the data, but you cannot recognize it. You cannot identify it. So the identification, the recognition, so you also require a whole lot of contextual information around it to be able to make sense of what has been found. You may, now I have served, served in CDAC for last uh, over 21 years. And I, 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 on my uh, desktop, I still have some files which are tw almost 20 years old. And the, the software I, which I used for creating those is not available anymore. Uh, anymore. I cannot read those files. Maybe even the operating system uh, prevailing at that time is also not available. It may not run on the current systems. So, uh, so, so basically, a similar kind of thing is happening when it comes to digital preservation. So this is one of the ways in which you know the the multimodal uh, access uh, and for accessing you need a, a repository of the memories. So this is how we can relate the things. This is one of the early visions that we had since I mentioned about in 1999. We had uh, this is a sketch. You know it it doesn't make sense uh, now, but uh, the National Repository of Multimedia. You know we had thought of something, but nothing came out. But it was way back in 1999. The, in, in 2001, uh, we, uh, we proposed something like uh, virtu using virtual reality for reconstruction of uh, destroyed, uh, you know, uh, ancient uh, structures, you know. So this is the Qutub Minar and the courtyard, you know. There is another Minar which Aurangzeb tried to construct, you know, which will be taller than Qutub Minar, you know, but he died when he built the first floor. So we, so we, have, we have visualized if, if it was constructed fully, uh, uh, how, how tall it would be in comparison with Qutub Minar. So, or the, the arches which were broken, so, so they have been reconstructed. And we had submitted such proposal, but it didn't receive much response. We, I mean, we, it we could not succeed. In 2002, uh, 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 actually, N. Gopalaswamy, who was uh, the, uh, previously the chief election commissioner, he also was a secretary of uh, Department of Culture, and he also happened to be the chairman of this, uh, the PRSG committee, which, uh, which steered the NMRC project. So since he knew us as uh, when he became secretary of culture, he told us that we, uh, we are Department of Culture, we don't know what are we uh, uh, holding, you know, we, we don't know what our heritage is, we have uh, no knowledge of it. We are a department with, uh, with no knowledge of it. Can you suggest something? So we suggested, a, we gave a proposal uh, on a National Repository of Museums in 2002, almost 11 years back. But uh, the, our proposal went in, and he was moved to Home Ministry in, during Bajpayee's government, and this proposal also was almost uh, not responded back. Only now, in 2013, the Ministry of Culture 
you know, after a long exercise of comparing with various other products, and they also involved the experts from Chicago, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the Institute of Art, wherein they have the curators and who are actually contributing to the Museum Excellence Program uh, as part of the, uh, the five-year plan which Ministry of Culture has. So, so they, they are the people who selected Jatan for standardizing across all the museums. And I'm very happy to report that during last two months, our team has deployed uh, Jatan Virtual Museum Builder in 10 national museums. So, uh, and the second thing is going to be, th there are 40 ASI museums. Uh, that is the second thing. After that, you know, we have to also uh, cloud enable Jatan Virtual uh, Museum uh, because that, uh, we have to have a multi-museum framework so that maybe the other hundreds of museums could also become part of it because it will not be possible to really uh, physically s set up this software in all the museums and some of them are so small that they may not be able to really afford the kind of infrastructure that it requires. So, so this uh, has been done. So uh, we are also uh, uh, developing the national portal and the pilot digital repository of national museums. So, so this is already, uh, uh, I mean, as instructed by the Ministry of Culture, the proposal uh, is also submitted and we are looking forward to working on it. So, so as you can see, over a period of 13 years, you know, we, we have been trying to uh, vi uh, visualize something like this and, and after a long time, this is happening. W what you can see here uh, or learn from this is we may be uh, very much ahead of uh, time in terms of the technologies, but the, the potential users, uh, you know, they, they are taking long, long time to catch up with us, you know. So by that time, we lose interest in that uh, technology and we move on. But the user has still not arrived there. So, uh, so this is a strange kind of uh, uh, paradox that we see here. Um, yeah, so... Uh, this is the, the national repository, how it is going to come up, various museums. We have also suggested that the gigabit network will be required. We, uh, we, uh, we, we observed that the NKN connectivity is uh, uh, quite uh, unutilized, the, uh, whereas the digital preservation actually provides an opportunity to transfer large volumes of data, you know, uh, wherein the, the, the connectivity can be very well used. So the museums should be connected. And uh, as, as part of our initiative, uh, as you know, we are working with National Archives of of India. So National Archives of India in another month's time they will be on NKN. So we had to uh, really uh, f fight along with them to get the, uh, get the NKN connectivity and it is going to happen very soon. So we have seen the typical cultural heritage. The other scenario is we are uh, in the digital preservation project, we are uh, working on the e-district uh, pilot. So the e-district services, if you, if you see the e-district implementations, uh, most of the e-districts are offering something like 25 citizen services. You know, it includes like caste certificate, income certificate, birth certificate, death certificate, and so on, you know, various services. And uh, uh, everything is online, Everything is authorized using a digital signature. So th the paper is only becoming a medium of delivering the certificate. So the original is in the uh, in bond digital, whereas the print is the second copy. You know? So what you will be holding in your hand is actually a copy. The original is, is the bond digital uh, record. So that requires to be preserved. And um, so, uh, so when we were discussing this at NEGP, they said that if actually they have a plan to offer something like 100 citizen services through e-districts and uh, we have something like six, 600 uh, districts, you know, or uh, uh, across various states and 1.2 billion population. What will be the size of this operation? And we tried to estimate something uh, if all 1.2 billion people were to use, you know, these 100 services, uh, it, it would size up to something like one exabyte. So, which is very huge and it will be difficult to manage. Um, and, uh, and in these services, I mean, many services will be used over and over again. So, uh, what we observed is that uh, here the databases are just inflating. You know, as we saw in the human brain that you keep certain things in short-term memory and you forget them after, because it is trivial, momentary. Only that is important that is remembered forever or for a long term. 
in e districts uh, now you have these 25 services some of these services are very trivial services you don't require to hold that data for long but there is no distinction in the database there is no distinction in terms of what should be retained for longer what should be retained for say only one one year after one year you may remove the data such distinction is not made anywhere in uh, any of the e governance projects and as a result their databases are uh, getting bigger and bigger they are gro growing in uh, several terabytes the backup replication etc is really becoming uh, a problem for them now i will relate this scenario with uh, what uh, we heard in the morning uh, also you know the idc you know they have been year after year they have been coming up with this report on uh, digital universe study you know so the, this is the latest report according to re this report the 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 size of the digital universe in india by 2012 was something like 127 uh, uh, exabytes and and it is expected to grow 20 through 23 times bigger by 2020 you know it will be something close to uh, three zettabytes uh, which will be uh, say maybe uh, uh, one tenth or maybe one eleventh of the overall size of the digital universe what also what they are also mentioning is that 61 percent of the data in this universe is completely unprotected uh, and people don't even know that something is worth uh, preserving uh, they are just having it there you know uh, and the digital the indian digital universe is growing by the size of uh, by 67 times you know faster than the uh, american digital universe so various in, uh, interesting comparisons have been provided so in this context, as part of the Center of Excellence for Digital National Archives of India. Now, previously there were paper records. Now, if they are all digital records, how are they going to transfer it? So, what, ki what kind, are they going to do it uh, through the network? If, if through the network, what are the mechanisms, what are the issues involved in that? The archival formats, the preservation strategies, digital migration. Uh, digital migration is one uh, area where we feel that the, uh, the, uh, some of the high performance uh, computing uh, um, uh, capabilities that CDAC has could be made use of. Um, we will look at some of the examples. For, uh, I'll give a, a, a concrete example here. We are working on the, the card project, the computer aided registration of documents of Andhra Pradesh. And there, the, in spite of using multi threading, we are able to ingest something like 20,000 records in a day and they have two crore legacy records which need to be ingested so even if we do it with this speed in a, in this way it may take us two years or more than two years so can this duration be reduced by using the hpc uh, infrastructure that cdac has so that is something which we would like to explore the uh, the metadata extraction integrity and authenticity uh, integrity and authenticity is very very important in preservation because um, those who are from i mean those who may know of archaeology they may uh, uh, they may understand it more effectively because it, producing a digital file is not enough it is important to prove that this is the one original one you know uh, and this has not been altered and this is the one which is authorized you know so that is the integrity and authenticity unless you be, are able to prove that so therefore you have to capture a whole lot of digital evidence to be able to substantiate the uh, the integrity and authenticity uh, the copyright protection information security search and retrieval access control audit and certification so the, the, the last one is very important because the trusted digital repositories are expected to be audited by a third party to uh, to certify that you know the, the data is uh, uh, is well preserved and uh, and it is looked after uh, you know the by the the skilled people etc there are various details to it which i will not go into uh, I'm very happy to report that that uh, the digital preservation standards uh, and guidelines developed by us have been finally notified by DIT, um, and this was a very long process. The first one is best practices, practices and guidelines for production of preservable e-records, and the second one is a uh, the metadata dictionary and schema, the preservation metadata dictionary and schema. So these uh, two standards have been uh, notified by DIT. So. The experience of developing these standards was uh, very educating for us. Um, as you can see here, in, in 2012, uh, you know, the final documents were, uh, the draft documents were uh, uh, submitted, and through that, you know, the review process and so many reviews, and at NEGP, it is sometimes really very tough to, uh, to face the reviews because you, they will be joined by so many consultants, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you are really 
uh, you know, you, uh, everything that you present can be torn apart, you know, and so it was such a learning experience for us. The public review, uh, I, most notably, I must mention that it was participated by uh, 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 the uh, new gen, Adobe, Wipro, Mastic, uh, Putney, uh, Putney Bowles, uh, HCL, HCL, Microsoft, and so the, the NASCOM helped us in getting feedback from them. And, uh, uh, and finally, you know, uh, we had a, a meeting with this, which was chaired by a secretary on 18 September. And uh, fortunately, Dr. Darbari was also present for that meeting. In that meeting, it was basically decided to uh, fi finally approve and notify the standards. So this was a long journey. And somewhere I feel that, you know, uh, my group started with myself as first member, you know. So s what I feel is that it, it took us almost... 15 or maybe 20 years to arrive where GIST group started, you know, with their inscript standard, you know. It is a long process. It is not easy uh, to, you know, even we have been fortunate to find an opportunity, you know, to, to be able to do something like this. So um, just as you had leap office, you know, which, uh, which was talk of the town in those days. And similarly, the Jatan has also been standardized ministry of, although a very, maybe a baby step, but it is towards a positive direction. The, now, in these standards, I'll give a very quick overview. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Mm, but uh, uh, while working on these standards, we uh, worked on uh, a number of things, the legal aspects. We studied the Information Technology Act 2000, the subsequent amendment uh, in, two, yeah, uh, in 2008, the IT Act notifications with regard to the, uh, the, the, the electronic records and the certain qualities associated with that, the RTI Act. So it has a lot of legal aspects to it when it comes to preserving electronic records or the e-governance records. The ISO standards which we have directly applied in this particular work are, you know, the information and documentation records management, the, the OAI standard, the audit and certification of uh, trusted digital repositories, and PDFA1, PDFA2, and uh, the, the Interparas guidelines. So, so these are these normative references that we use. So a quick round of this, uh, uh, the, the first standard I can give you, the, normally what is happening in entire e-governance scenario is you are only creating electronic records. You have a system which creates electronic records. You know, what is required is that you should be able to, uh, you know, uh, capture the electronic records so that they become transferable to an archival system. Presently, everything is maintained in the database. And, uh, and then having tr transferred it, you, you should be able to preserve it. So the, the second thing which, uh, which is missing is the, the retention policies, disposition policies, access policies, which are very crucial to uh, electronic records. Who has access to, uh, and how much? You know, who, who can modify it? Who can delete it? who can uh, have a bu bulk access to the records. You know, like, for example, uh, the birth, cert birth records in a e e or maybe passport records. Who has bulk access to all the records, you know? So this is a very pri privileged access. So how it can be controlled unless it is specified, you know? So, uh, so unless it is uh, uh, documented. So, uh, so, so all that has been. So in the present scope of this particular uh, uh, standard, we have focused on non-rendered e-records, which are the database records, and the rendered e-records in the document format. So, uh, so these two things have been focused on. Uh, we already, during the public review, we have received a lot of suggestions to take up other aspects, you know, other say audio, video, the, uh, the digital images, you know, there is a lot of confusion because the digitization projects are being launched at the state level, national level, everywhere in every organization, but there is no specification to look up to, you know, if you have certain kind of things. So there have been demands to standardize that as well. Email preservation, how emails, now, as you know, recently, DIT is uh, also uh, launching an email policy uh, for all the, uh, the central government organizations. So, uh, so email preservation, f particularly from the RTI uh, 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 point of view, is very crucial. So, so the first uh, standard which uh, which I mentioned, what it does is it helps you in uh, producing an acceptable 
uh, package to the OAIS, the Open Archival Information Standard. So this is the, uh, the simplified representation of that. If the input is not acceptable, then it rejects it. So here, uh, we use the term ingesting. Ingesting uh, actually comes from maybe biology. So, uh, uh, so ingesting is when we eat some food, you know, first we recognize that it is edible. Then you chew it, and then the saliva is mixed, it is processed, and then it is gulped, you know, then you, uh, it goes into your system. Similarly, OAS first needs to recognize the, what the input is, you know, whether the input is valid, it, should it be ingested, is it complying with the technical specifications? If it is not, then it should be kept out, it should be rejected, so, or it should be acted upon. So, to be able to achieve that, uh, the submission information package, as we call, uh, you know, we have to have these standards in place so that the e-governance system is able to give us the acceptable output so that it can be preserved. So that was the first target. In the, uh, we have also defined the, the generic characteristics of what, what do you mean by a preservable e-record? What makes it pres preservable? First of all, you know, it must have a stable content because if, we, if it has an unstable content, it means it is a current record. It is still in the process, so it need not be preserved. It can remain in the current system. So, um, uh, whereas if it has a stable content and no more processing is required, then it should be uh, captured and sent for preservation. It should be stored in low risk, open specifications, uh, standardized and sustainable file formats. It must have a unique record identifier. So here the unique record identifier is a key because uh, the digital rights are always associated with the name of the, uh, the, the, the digital file. So, so the file name must be sacrosanct, you know, it must have some logic, it must be backed by some policy. You also have something like, I would like to just tell, you also have something like persistent identifiers. That's a new thing which we are yet to work on, but we will be working on it. Persistent identifier is the URLs which are, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's the URL itself is like a ISBN, you know, or like a ISBN code, wherein the object available at a particular URL is the authentic one, you know, so that is how it is uh, certified. So we will have to uh, create uh, some sort of uh, um, uh, maybe a small organization or maybe within DIT, somebody who does this job, who, who gives the, provides the persistent identifiers. Uh, you require the preservation metadata. The object must be self-contained to the extent that is possible and it should be transfer transferable. So in uh, uh, e-governance system, what we find is uh, it is the policies need to define how much should be preserved. You know, do you want only the final outcome or do you want to go back in the process and the various decisions that took place in the process also have to be preserved. So this is decided by the policy. So, uh, yeah. So it, without these policies, as I explained, the, the databases are getting bigger and bigger, you know, because all the trivial information is also retained, you know, and it is also maintained within the database. So for the non-rendered e-records, as we can see here, uh, you can capture these e-records in XML uh, format. The, if the images or the digital signature associated with it, it can be included in the base 664 uh, format. The XML-based uh, formats, uh, you know, such as XBRL, ODF, uh, open office XML are also supported here. Uh, there is a, another interesting thing which we brought up uh, a, while working on this. Now, the, uh, the European Commission has already agreed upon uh, the common XML schemas for uh, birth registration or, you know, so that a person uh, migrates to another country, his birth record can be transferred and, and, and the systems are interoperable. So similar thing is required here as well. Uh, in this particular, um, the, if you were to give a rendered document form, then then we have uh, prescribed the PDF for archival format. So this is a the, uh, ISO standard. This is not the usual PDF format. The Adobe PDF is considered as a, it, it's a proprietary closed source format, so one wouldn't recommend it for preservation purpose. So for preservation purpose, you have PDF 
uh, PDF A 1A, level 1A and level 1B. So uh, the 1A basically embeds all the fonts and images, uh, color information, the color profile, etc. The device independent color profile is also made part of the document. Uh, the PDF A 1B, it is basically if you have the scanned images and if you want to create it, in, uh, create a document. So then PDF 1B basically it preserves the visual appearance of the document. And PDF A is highly interoperable whether it is uh, mobile phones or any uh, all the heterogeneous operating systems it, it goes across so PDFA is ISO has committed it as electronic paper you know so just as a paper will remain readable even hundred years from now the PDFA is desired to re remain readable it will co continue to be supported so you also have PDFA 2A and 2B so uh, the 2A, the, the most notable aspect is it supports advanced uh, digital signatures, so uh, which are yet to be adopted in, uh, in India, but we have uh, recommended that they should, it should be done. Uh, <laughs> So that the uh, the digital signatures, you know, as you know, uh, they break within a short span of time, and you are not able to validate. So the the advanced digital signatures, uh, uh, you know, are supported in this. So basically, uh, what we have recommended, and if this is a major change for the all e-governance projects, is you have e-record e creating system, then you capture the e-records, have provisions to capture the e-records which need to be preserved, and then you transfer these e-records to the uh, the preservation repository, which is where we, uh, the OAIS is residing, so where the records can be uh, preserved. So the, o, the, as you can see, the trustworthy digital repository is the uh, basically place where it is preserved. It will serve more like a bank, you know, like you, you cannot keep all your money uh, in your house. I mean, you, you since you cannot ha manage it, you give it to a bank, and bank is regulated, audited, and they manage your money you know, on your behalf, and they give it back to you when you want. So trusted digital repositories are going to function in that manner. So that is a new concept. The second standard, this is a very, I will be explaining very briefly. Uh, um, now, if you find a digital file, say 20 years from now, uh, you will need to uh, know so many things about it, you know, to be able to make sense of it. Uh, I mean, what is the unique identifier? I mean, because that is the point of validation, whether it is an authorized one. Uh, who, to whom was it issued? Who had produced it? You know, what was the context in which it was produced? Uh, what was the basis on which the particular e-record was issued? Which software was used for producing that e-record? You know, what is the file format? You know, if that file format is not readable, how do I migrate it into another file format? What, what what are the evidences of its authenticity? Has it been tampered? Has it been changed or forged? Um, you know, uh, any other electronic records are related with it? Can you form some relations? Uh, how long should it be kept? Uh, there are so many questions, you know, related with that. So to be able to answer those, you know, we have designed this XSD, uh, the, the Preservation Metadata Dictionary, which, which has got uh, seven major aspects to it. Uh, first is the cataloging information. The second is enclosure information, you, because electronic records have enclosures as well. The provenance information. So provenance is the origin. So here it is the technological provenance. You know, it's not the geographical provenance. You have the device ID. You have. You may have IP addresses. You may have so many addresses which define, uh, which uh, which give you evidence that okay, this is the computer which produced that record, or maybe the server produced that record, or or these are the systems which actually uh, control to that. The fixity information, representation information, digital signature information, because the signature, as the signatures expire or the people change, you have different signatures, and uh, so who issued uh, that certificate, when did it expire, and so there are so many things that you uh, access rights information. So, so all this information can be captured into this. Uh, so I think, yeah, so I will quickly conclude. So all the, uh, the, the design of these standards uh, is uh, fully supported by IT Act, you know. So I, the, I, you, I will just quickly touch upon some of the things, you know. IT Act talks about requirements of for retention of electronic records, you know. Uh, uh, basically, whatever is applicable to paper is also applicable to the uh, digital records, you know. Uh, the second thing is uh, it should be retained in such a way uh, that you should be able to demonstrate to represent it accurately. Because in the court of law, if it has to be admissible, you must be able to show that this is the authentic re rendering of it, and this is how it was. Even if it has gone through the migrations, you should be able to establish that. Uh, 
uh, origin, destination, date, and time, uh, et cetera, has to be there. The, the, the computer which produced the e-record, you know, was actually being used, you know, regularly to produce e e the electronic records. So you need to, so the, it, we cannot use any, any computer in a typical uh, scenario. Uh, presently, there is no inventory of it. We, we, who is using which machine to produce the record? But it will have to be uh, a registered system, you know, ideally. And, and perhaps with the time, the digital signature, time stamping, you know, uh, it requires you to identify the server. It has to be registered, and only then through, uh, through that you are able to do that. So, uh, uh, so there are several things related to it. Uh, the IT Act, IT Act notifications also talk about the evidentiary value, preservability, etc. So people have done a lot of thinking, and these aspects have been there. But the only thing is they have not been acted upon. So. During the meeting that took place uh, on 18th uh, September, the Secretary also gave decisions. We have submitted a draft on the National Digital Preservation Policy, so he has given a decision that this policy should be uh, worked upon and, and finalized and it should be launched. He also asked us to work on the draft rules under the IT Act. Uh, for digital preservation. So uh, we have done a lot of work in that and the draft rules are also submitted. So that unless there are mandations, unless there are directives, uh, this will not happen. Uh, so just as you need to fix the co code at the lowest level, you know, sometimes you need to fix the code at the highest level. So this is something, uh, it's a effort towards that so that, you know, this, do this domain gets created, you know, and, uh, and the work shall happen. Uh, we also introduced that the, the advanced electronic signatures for archival, uh, uh, which, which are already introduced in uh, Europe, which uh, uh, presently we, we do not have uh, the, we have PKCS, uh, so the advanced signature should be brought in here. The code of practice for legal admissibility of scan, scanned documents has to be, so we have proposed something under the IT Act. Now, uh, when a physical document is lost, if you have a digital copy, scanned copy of it, and if it is authorized with digital signature by the, the concerned authority, it should be admissible in the court of law. Something like that has been proposed. Like, it is like e-notarization. Today, a paper document can be notarized by a notary, but the scanned copy of the same paper, can it, can it be notarized as original? Today, there is no legal support for that. It cannot be recognized. So we have given those recommendations in this. Uh, what we see is that in, in the policy, we have recommended that we are creating the, this uh, state data center infrastructure across the country. So these state data centers, SDCs, could become potential digital repositories. And, uh, and they should be uh, geared, to, uh, geared to become basically that. So. Uh, so as far as the trusted digital repository, as uh, we have given it a name, Digital A, uh, so, the, so we will have to create such digital layers, established digital layers across the country. And we, we have been able to do certain things. You know, uh, we have uh, worked on some of the e-governance uh, pilots. Uh, the e-record digital AI is a system which we, it is currently being developed. We, uh, in fact, most of the software uh, work that we are doing is in the development process. It is not finished as yet. The standards have been developed, and several things are falling in line. We are trying to put it together. So this is uh, the kind of setup which we will be setting up uh, in the uh, month of January in, uh, in Hyderabad. Uh, wherein, you know, the, the Datantar software, which we will be getting a glimpse of it, which actually captures, captures the electronic records, and then it transfers to the digital AI system, the OAI system, where it can be preserved. So, yeah, so I'm stopping here. <laughs> uh, the boss is here, so I should, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes, I'm concluding. So, so we are going to see uh, the demonstration of the the working prototype of Datantar. It is still not complete. We are still working on many of these things. Uh, so, in the E district, when you actually render the birth record, what you see is uh, something like that on the left hand side. It is dynamically rendered in the browser. Now, this is completely contrary to uh, the digital preservation uh, requirements. You know because. In every browser, the, the record looks different. You know, the, the contents are changing. As you know, we, you have so many versions of HTMLs and browsers render them differently. So the same thing happens here. So 
the first uh, few months, uh, we had to battle with uh, several experts in NEGP to decide what actually requires to be preserved, whether this, uh, the, the rendition in the uh, browser or the database records. So finally, we realized that it is the database record which has to be preserved because uh, this is a database from the Uttar Pradesh which has got 25 lakh uh, you know, citizen records. Uh, this, the, the size of the database is, was, I think, some five, six terabytes or something like that. So uh, uh, the digital signature, the enclosures, the uh, associated images, everything is stored in, in the database. And uh, so how to preserve these records? Because database itself cannot be uh, preserved because you are, again, dependent on another, you know, uh, vendor or maybe it will be subjected to uh, change in the versions uh, or if that one DB file gets corrupted, you may lose everything. So the records have to be captured and pulled out from there. So only this aspect we are going to see uh, the e-record capturing software. The, digit the digitalized system we are not demonstrating. Maybe in the next CPTF we could see that. So I request my... Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Heman Darbari to hand over a memento as a token of appreciation to Dr. Dinesh Katre for his outstanding contributions. Uh, we can take up one question for this session. Thank you.